We're getting started a little late, but I promise to give you full attention and full great content. What I was starting to say is, please mark your calendars, and actually lots of you already have, and you've already registered. We've just completed our initial early bird registration for our SHIP conference in Austin, Texas. It's going to be fantastic. We've got the book Built to Sell and the author from the book Built to Sell, John Warlow, coming to present. And I was recommending earlier that you read it ahead of time and have some great questions for him because he knows all about the way to build and grow a business and leverage it to get to the point where if you'd like to sell, you'll be able to sell. So that's something we really um, recommend you reading ahead of time. Second, um, the content is awesome. We've got some speakers backed by popular demand. For instance, Ariane Batazzi, who's a good friend of mine from Carmel Mountain Preschool in California. She'll be back talking about the outdoor classroom. Several other fabulous speakers. And then the keynote speakers are unbelievable. Kathy has talked about them on the other webinars, and I would refer you to our website and our shift page, which is here. You can browse the sessions. Um, again, highly recommend. Hope to see you all there. And this was so much fun. Check it out. We just last week had a full hinge strategic planning session. It was so much fun. There's Kathy Legan doing a selfie. She's cool. And there she is. Here we are all working. Uh, did a lot of brainstorming. Came away with a plan for the year. Uh, teams and partners of who's working on what, what our team goals are. And, you know, honestly, mainly the goal is giving good customer care and customer service to all of you, whether you're trying to grow your school and you need the consulting piece, whether you're trying to figure out some little bumps in the road that you've got and need a little bit of help, uh, uh, critiques and uh, positive goal setting, or if you're ready to sell and what that, that planning and that timeline would look like. So that's um, really our goal for you is to just deliver great customer service all the time. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. If you look at our Facebook page today, it's hilarious. Um, we went axe throwing as a team building act, uh, activity. Oh my gosh, I was the worst one. And I was actually sore the next day, which is super embarrassing, but everybody had so much fun. So if you check out our Facebook page, we've got pictures of that. It was, it was absolutely a blast. So we're starting to talk initially about how we can engage staff around the shared goal of full enrollment. And the first thing I'd like to do is just review some of the steps and some of the strategies we've talked about in other webinars and also last time. The first thing I like to do is just talk about the math and just the reality of if you do the math and understand what an empty slot costs you, it helps you articulate it to your staff and also articulate it to your parent consumers, the ones that are your heavy sneezers, which would be someone that is out in the community a lot and has a lot of clout or uh, knows a lot of people, those soccer moms or those bus stop parents that know everyone. So knowing about having empty slots and having parents articulate for you that there's openings at your school is really important. But the most important part is knowing those empty seats and how much they cost you. Um, again, that said, we always talk at Hinge about best practices, and that would assume your program is in place. You've got plenty of teachers. If you don't have the program and the quality in place, you'll want to work on that first, of course. And then second, of course, you've got to have plenty of teachers. I was talking to a gal yesterday at one of our consulting clients, and I was saying, oh, it sounds like you could use some help with growing your enrollment. And she said, yes, absolutely. But first, I really need help with growing the staff. And in her case, oh, my gosh, she's got it really rough. She lives in an area where one of the Amazons just came in. And so she said Amazon is advertising 18 to $21 an hour. And so she's competing, trying to pay, you know, 10 or $12 an hour. She's really struggling with, with Amazon as a competitor. So, again, having the staff in place. And then having the staff do a little dreaming. If you're full to capacity, what could you do? How would you share with the staff? Would you bonus staff? Would you give them raises? Would you be able to send them, send them to school, to, uh, have them get a CDA? What would they be able to do for you? And how would that make your program and ultimately the quality for the children and their families better? The Monopoly game is a really fun activity to do. Um, just basically, you just get a lot of the play money and quantify for the staff exactly what the rent is, exactly what payroll is, oh, payroll taxes, utilities, Property taxes, oh, by the way, we have taxes on our computers, 
all those things that staff wouldn't know. How would they know unless they had a small business? So letting staff know what exactly your program costs you. So many times they think the owner has a lot of money or the director's paid a lot. Well, that, that, that's not the whole picture by any stretch. And then also how do family and staff discounts impact growth? Definitely a big issue. We're gonna talk a little bit about phone skills today. And that's just a review from last month. I would recommend you going to last month's webinar because we went much deeper on phone skills. But just for a couple minutes, just talking and reminding you about phone skills. Implementing continuous growth and training with your staff, it, it, it's a super good way to start is just with the phone skills. Everyone should know how to be courteous and answer the phone with a warm voice tone, not a lot of noise in the background, and just so, just being able to articulate one or two or three elements about your program. Because when that phone call comes in and parents are interested in touring your school, your goal on answering the phone is to book the tour. You're not going to book the tour if you're not friendly and you're not asking and wanting to know about the family. One strategy would be certifying your staff phone skills. So maybe do a Saturday training or even a lunchtime training and have the staff practice and maybe role play with each other on phone skills. And then do a certificate that they are able to answer your phone. It sounds really silly, but it, it also sets the stage that your standards are really high and that not just anyone can answer the phone, that if we, again, back to the slide before, if we're doing a lot of dreaming and everyone has buy-in that if we get our school full, or full to staffing at least, what, how would that benefit everyone? Ultimately, first and foremost, the children, but also the staff and, of course, the families, the parents. There's nothing worse for parents than having to pull their child out for a program that in their mind is not good quality. A general script that flows on the phone, lots of people just do simple phone scripts. You can Google about phone scripts or you can make one of your own, but in general, phone scripts would ask the pertinent questions that you need answered. What's the name of the child, the date of birth of the child? What caused them or had them call today? What initiated the call? What, how can you help? What's their timeline? Definitely do not get off the phone without a phone number or numbers and an email. Uh, definitely, of course, you want the parent's name. Uh, and then having specific location, teacher and classroom USPs. We're going to come up, um, come to a slide with more details on that. It's a review from last month, but it's really setting the stage. If you're jumping on the call today, you'll really need that as a reference point. And then this sounds crazy, but if you can record calls when they're coming in so you can assess later, that would be awesome. And now we just take a cell phone and let's just record the staff. You don't really care what the parents are saying or the caller is saying so much as how the staff member is responding to it. So I love to do that and have my teachers try out phone skills and record themselves. And it's super intimidating at first. Try to just make it a game and lots of fun. And then secret shop. If you secret shop, you don't even necessarily have to secret shop in your own area if you're uncomfortable with that. Go on one of the one of the Facebook groups that have lots of early childhood programs and secret shop for someone else. Or if you're buddies with people in certain Facebook groups or early childhood groups, ask, hey, let's secret shop for each other. Let's for each other's staff and see how they're doing on phone skills. Because the fact of the matter is, if they're not answering the phone and they're not engaging with the families, they're not gonna book the tour. And so who would you rather tell to you if, if your staff or you are fairly weak on that, but someone else that you trust? And then you do the same for them. When families call, one of my big tricks is not to be the first one to hang up. You don't want to talk all day long or even for a long period of time because everyone's busy. But just leave those couple second pauses when you finish answering a question, kind of like that, and the other parent will the parent will have a chance to jump in with another question. Of course, even asking what else can I answer for you um, is is also really helpful. We want to call to come to a natural end, and we don't want to rush it one way to get off the call nor extend it unnaturally. So that's a trick, never be the first one to hang up. And then I love this phone skill trick, and it would be sending the caller someplace else to find out about your program. So you've probably done a little bit of front loading or a little bit of orientation about your school, then definitely say, hey, check out our Facebook page. 
We have wonderful pictures and lots of content and information about why we do what we do every day. And so you be sure to like it, follow us, and that will give them what we call social proof. They will see your philosophy. If you have an outdoor classroom, they'll see that. If you're very heavy on process-oriented art rather than arts and crafts, they'll see that. If teachers are veterans and you've got a long-standing, fabulous staff, and you celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, they'll see a little bit about your school culture. So again, sending them somewhere else besides just listening to you. The other obvious one would be looking at your reviews. And we'll talk about that on a positive and a negative um, point in a minute. Number one goal is to build a genuine relationship. I can't say that enough. You know, where are you moving from? Oh, how was Texas? I'm in Virginia. Or oh, you're starting a new job? Tell me about it. Or you must be so excited. Is that what you went to school for? Tell me about little darling. How's Henry? Is Henry excited about school? Has he been in preschool or child care before? Oh, you had a nanny. Let me explain the difference between a nanny and group care. So you're going to take exactly what they say, take a minute to pause and think, how can I serve this parent the best way possible? They must be nervous about coming into child care. That's great to ask. How do you feel about it, mom? That's an awesome question that parents love to hear, that you have a lot of empathy and you're actively listening. The USPs, I promise. Um, and you can have these slides, of course, and Terry can help you receive the slides or um, we'll email them after the webinar. The USP is a unique selling point about your school. So you'll want to have classroom USPs, maybe the number of children in the room, the number of boys and girls, the number of students that have been in the school a long time, uh, children that are most interested in maybe a class that's very literacy oriented and the tour comes in talking about that the mom or dad is a school teacher. And that would be something awesome. The Rooster Classroom absolutely loves to read. Look at our reading wall. We've already read 105 books and it's only November, something like that. Location USP, that refers to what, what neighborhoods are you serving? What elementary schools does your school feed into? What landmarks are nearby? Obviously, if you're near a city park or some special landmark in your area, you'll want to say that not only as a location point, sort of like a Google map for their brain, but also just so they know you're located in, in an awesome area. If you've got several locations, it's also important to say, and I have three locations in Virginia, to say, um, tell me a little bit about which part of town you live in so I can make sure you're calling the right location. That helps a lot as, again, good customer care and customer service. Also, the employers that are in town, maybe they work at a local, IT company. And you'll say, where are you moving to? What, what company will, will you be working for? And that's a really good way to connect them with other families that maybe work there. Oh, we have five other school teacher parents at this location. I bet you know them. Do you know the gym teacher at the local high school? That's a really good way to connect. And again, the connections and building a genuine relationship is the key. And then the teacher USPs, obviously everyone wants to know about the teacher or teacher. I always say, you know, there's a main teacher in the classroom or teacher or co-teacher, teacher assistant, but we consider all the children all of our children. So I want to talk to you about our whole school and the philosophy we use in hiring teachers and that, you know, if you're using us from 7 or 7.30 till 5 or 5.30, most likely your child will meet and interact with five or six teachers, maybe the opening teachers, the closing teachers, the regular classroom teacher. Then, of course, our classroom teacher has to have a quick break. So they'll be the, the nap room teacher. So we talk a lot about teachers, and you'll want to talk about their credentials, longevity. If they're a mom or a grandma, dad or a grandpa, uniqueness about the teacher is awesome. We've got one teacher at one of the schools that's a certified Montessori teacher. I always talk about that. I say we love lots of different educational philosophies. This particular gal has a Montessori background. She integrates it with our emergent curriculum and process-based curriculum. Lots of similarities. Practice makes perfect. I love this, role playing with the staff. You're going to role play with recording calls. You're going to role play on your tours as well. So we're still finishing calls and recommending secret shopping. To remind you about last month's book, it is The Carrot Principle. I love this book because it's in, all in the context of planting a carrot. 
kind of like we plant seeds for our teachers and as we're growing their careers, and we plant seeds for the children as we're helping them grow and develop and working with the whole child. So it starts with the seed and the plant nurturing, how to weed, and then harvesting. And it's, it's awesome. So just reminding you about last month's record, recommended reading. This month's recommendation I absolutely love. Kathy Ligon asked us to all read it before we came to our strategic planning this month, and it's called The Go-Giver. Oh, my gosh. So it's kind of like a fable, and it presents this um, salesperson has a problem trying to close a deal, and he's got this big deadline. And initially, you'll think this has nothing to do with preschool, which it really doesn't. It really has to do with who you are and how you grow yourself as a person and how you add value to everyone you meet instead of just thinking it's all about the sale, or all about the tour, or all about the phone call and booking the tour. It's really how can I add value? Maybe, some, maybe someone's coming from out of town and they only need you very part-time or they're really looking for a nanny and they're not going to enroll in your school. It's still so much better for you and your program if you take that time to build that relationship with that family and add value. So that's one thing this book talks about. Another element is being authentic, really being yourself with the tours or with yourself with your staff. It all goes hand in hand, honestly, with the families. And then my favorite one is being receptive, being open to having someone either give you a complaint or constructive criticism, or also giving you a helping hand. I love that because so many times, especially women in a nurturing field, we think we can do it all ourselves. And well, we pretty much can. We don't need to, and so much better the whole idea, there's no I in team. If we work together with our staff or with our families to grow the best school we can for our children, so much better for everyone. So I'm asking you all to read The Go-Giver, and please give us some feedback about it. Also, if you're doing any questions or comments, please let us know if you've read it already and what you think about it. And going to the next slide. We're talking about tours. So tours. The easiest thing I can say about tours and I coach my directors and my staff on is it's an open book test. If you booked a tour, you know the time they're coming in, you know what the child's name is, a little bit about them if you've done a really good job on your phone skills, and you're ready to go. You've let your staff know that the tour is coming. Probably that morning you'll remind them again or that afternoon. I like to do tours just two more two times a morning. Um, we've done it like this for years and years, and it works really well for us. It's also really awesome for our teachers. Um, I think it's really stressful for teachers to have strangers in a room in and out all day long because your teachers want to teach. They really don't want to stop everything and chit-chat, and they're focused on the students and the learning and, and the fun and also keeping children safe and, and all of that. So I like to book tours very short periods of time, 9, 30, and 11, and then the teachers know what to expect. They'll know ahead of time when the tour is coming, a little bit about the tour, whether or not they're bringing the little, the little darling or not, and usually what our expectation is. So if it's a teacher that's been with us a very long time, we'll expect them to do a tour takeover and talk a little bit about their classroom. Everyone is expected to handshake, eye contact, greet the person by name, introduce themselves, and at least be able to say one or two things about their school or their room. Usually I just ask them to say something about what they're doing at that moment. Oh, we're just getting ready to, we just read the story, The Wild Things, where the wild things are, and we're getting ready to act it out. Uh, Joey here is Max, and you know that's such a great book. So um, talk a little bit about literacy, a super important part of our day. That would be an example of what any teacher could really do. Um, and then, of course, during tours, you're going to use assumptive language. When Johnny comes to Bright Beginning, to name my school, um, he's going to absolutely love our new outdoor classroom. We just added a whole balance theme area. And you think, does he like to be outside? And really get to know about Johnny, but again, the assumptive language. Another one would be assuming they're starting soon. Oh, I hope. Chloe can start in the next couple weeks because I'd love her to go on the pumpkin patch field trip or be able to go pick apples. That would be another example of using a subject language. 
if something goes wrong, use an example of what went wrong and talk about your quality or what you'll do, what, how you handle the bumps. And I'm going to talk about that at the end because that's one of my favorite parts of this presentation. This is a review, what is the lifetime value of an enrollment? I love this. So you'll take your three-year-old rate, and we've coached on this many times before. I'm just making it $900. And if they're there about 12 months, and then do they stay two or three years? Maybe they have two children in the family. And you're going to get a wow number. It's going to shock you. Um, our average client, it would be fifty to $75,000 for the lifetime value of one enrollment. And I think if you let the staff know about that and you're just going that extra mile when the bumps happen and the child was changed and the wrong diaper is put on the baby and you know, bumps like that happen every day. It's how we handle them and how transparent we are about them that makes the difference and adds the value and the trust for the family. So again, lifetime value of an enrollment, um, nobody's disposable. If a staff member is ready to leave, our program, they're unhappy about something. We want to know why. We want to stop the bleeding on anything like that. Same thing with the with the enrollment. So knowing the lifetime value and having the staff understand that it really does matter. Every single person counts is really important. More staff expectations for tours. I did this briefly, but I'll just go over it so you have the slide. At least one day ahead, most teachers like to know there's a chore coming in their room. They can adapt maybe something particularly messy. For me, I want them to have the messier the better because our philosophy is very hands-on, sensory-oriented, learning through play. Maybe they're just not ready to do that with visitors coming in. And maybe it's an activity they've never done before and they're a little bit uncomfortable showing that off to a new family. So maybe they'll adapt their schedule slightly and maybe be outside or perhaps doing a certain language arts or math game, totally fine. You'll want all the families, all, sorry, all the teachers to be able to greet the children by name, the family by name, and ask a little bit about the little one. The little one does come on the tour. We want, depending on the child and the child's needs and um, willingness, you'll want to try to incorporate them into the classroom just a little bit if you can. Um, would would Henry like to come and listen to a story? And he's more than welcome to stay for a few minutes and play with us while you finish the tour. Or you may, you're more than welcome to have him come and stay in our circle time or morning meeting, and you sit back and, and observe for a few minutes. Uh, our directors are really comfortable doing that, letting the family stay in the classroom and observe for maybe five or ten minutes, and then coming back and checking on them and taking them through the rest of the building. I'm really particular on classrooms being tour ready. I think it's really important that at any time, classrooms are tour ready. That would mean that activities are out, they're not putting the sensory motor theme table or the dyed rice and noodles away. Um, teachers, teachers, you know, don't like messy rooms and they get, they get very particular about what their room looks like. But the parents really want to see us in action. That's where they're coming in the middle of the morning for a tour. So classrooms should be tour ready. That means they should be relatively clean. I mean, preschools are a little dirty sometimes and we get a little cluttered. Um, and that's an expectation that the parents should be. And, and sometimes they walk in and say, oh my gosh, this is a little chaotic. And you think, well, it's, you know, a two-year-old. Um, and so setting up accurate and appropriate expectations for parents is really important. So back to tour ready, the classrooms should be tour ready, but realistic. You don't want to have a showpiece as if you're going to be in a magazine ad or maybe some of our website pictures, and then the day they drop off for their first day of school, you know, it's seemingly chaotic. It needs to be realistic. Uh, I like to do a five-minute warning for staff. Say the tour's coming in at 9.30. So they ring the doorbell, we greet, we do our opening, and we sit down and chit-chat, get to know them a little bit. I'll usually excuse myself while they're filling out our intake form. And just so let the staff know, the tour is here. I'll be bringing them to you in about five minutes. I'll show any room that the tour is interested in and then older. For instance, if it's a three-year-old tour, I'm probably not going to show the baby, waddler, toddler, two rooms, unless they're asking to see the whole school, in which case, of course, I would accommodate. Maybe they're having another baby. Maybe their neighbor said, hey, tell me about the tour. I might go look, 
or maybe they just want to know the scope and sequence of all your curriculum and kind of everything that children have already learned from the other classrooms before they get to the three-year-old room. Then I'll always share the four-year-old room. If I have two rooms of both ages and I can accommodate the tour, I'll also go ahead and say I'm going to show you two three-year-old rooms and two four-year-old rooms. I'd like you to really look at those three-year-old rooms because I have openings in both of them. Look at the teaching style, the makeup of the class. Which room do you think Chloe would be more comfortable in? When possible, I will allow parents to guide me on that enrollment. When it's not possible, obviously, I'll say here's the opening, this is the room, and use my USPs from the several slides ago to talk about the room and, and why I think the room would be fabulous for Chloe. Um, I, again, I reiterate, greeting by name, this is the teacher's greeting by name, shaking hands and giving a smile or genuine hello. If they're busy and in the middle of something, stay there diapering or pottying. Um, I mean, obviously, actually, I try to, I try not to visit right when they're diapering and pottying just for privacy for children. And also, it's not our best look, right? Um, it can be if we're very nurturing, but in general, I want to show up our program and I want the teachers to shine with their personality. Um, if you can switch places for a couple minutes and have the teachers tell USPs for their room, that's ideal. And then engage with the child gently. We get so excited about seeing children because we're used to children every day, all day. Sometimes I think we can intimidate children a little bit. So I like to do a little bit of a soft approach with the children and, and take a, their, a lead from them. To our best practices. All right. So tour giver certified, this is exactly like the phone, the phone answer or certification, right? So if you're answering the phone and knowing the phone script, same thing for the tour giver certification. It's just a little certificate you're going to do as the owner or as the director that several people besides you can give a tour. And so you'll want to make sure that off the top of their head they can talk about the program. And they can answer maybe the harder 15 questions that you typically get. Tell me about your biting policy. Tell me when you're closed. Tell me about the credentials of the teacher. Tell me about your licensing status. I see the kids are outside in the outdoor classroom. Are they dirty? Of course they are. Um, how do you handle that? Oh, we have a washer and dryer, or parents bring extra changes of clothes. The teachers know all the answers, but to, to just think extemporaneously and authentically takes practice. We all have done tours a really long time, so not much phases us. But think about a new tour giver, so give them lots and lots and lots of practice. I like to shadow. I coach on this all the time. It's called Do Watch, Watch Do. And y'all have heard it if you've visited any of our webinars or seen you speak at any of our conferences or other national conferences. And so essentially, I'm going to do the tour, and I'm going to talk to the teacher about it um, or the person I'm certifying. And then they're shadowing me. So I'm doing while they're watching. And that might happen 10 times. It might happen for six months. They might not be comfortable. Honestly, if it takes six months, they're probably not going to be the best tour giver. Because usually tour givers are excited to do it. They're really, they're your raving fans. But you'll give them the do watch. Then you'll switch places. And it's called do watch, watch do. Then you'll watch while they do. And you'll do that multiple times. And that way, it's just a little safety net for the staff member. You'll be able to jump in if they get stumped. Oh, tell me about biting. Do you kick kids out if they bite? You know, they might panic. Oh, my gosh, well, no, we don't. But why would you say that? Do you think we do? And they kind of get in their own head instead of, oh, gosh, great question. First of all, biting is really normal. Tell me a little bit about why you're asking the question so I can make sure I answer it best for you. Here's our policies. Here's, you know, here's what we know about biters. Here's what we know about the bitees, and so on. Um, and then focusing, let's see, tour best practices. And then always um, before a tour, sending a reminder, text, or phone call. I like a phone call, honestly, but that's sometimes a generational thing. I'm a boomer. Millennials like text. So if it's a millennial parent, what we know about millennials, they may just assume a text. Don't bother them with a phone call. Um, but it depends on that initial intake call. That's a really good time to ask. How would you like us to communicate with you? And actually, we do ask that at the right beginning. So if they say they want phone calls or texts, we'll try to accommodate because, again, that's back to being 
really receptive and responsive to their needs and their wishes. It shows that I'm listening to them. Following a natural routine during a tour. We've talked before about tour stops. Tour stops would be either signs or fancy with beautiful photography or just something that you remember in your mind, I'm going to stop in the kitchen because we do all organic food now, so I want the families to know how health conscious we are. Or definitely the outdoor classrooms or yards, um, playgrounds. Maybe you've got a nature trail. Maybe you've got a wide open space outside. Definitely have the parents go out and see and feel what that would feel like for their child to be out in your beautiful play yard every day. Definitely if you've got something special like maybe an art lab or a lot of the Reggio schools have the art labs, the ateliers, fabulous place to stop. They should always all be tour ready. Maybe you've got a special music teacher and that music teacher's there at that moment for the tour. How great is that? So you'll definitely say, I'm showing you the three-year-old room and we'll pop into the four-year-old room, but I want you to see the music teacher we've got. Uh, we've got her hired. She comes to every class once a week. It doesn't cost you any more. Or if it does, this is what it costs you. And so let them observe anything special going on. We have a bookmobile that comes every other week to all of our locations. And so I definitely try to promote our bookmobile because we're very strong on literacy. We're in a university community. Our families are very well educated. We have a higher end clientele. So I definitely want to plug the things that we authentically do that we absolutely love to share about our program. So that goes to the three elements that interest the family. And then don't forget their name. Um, nothing worse than, you know, they're coming and you forget their name. You know, just whatever, even if you need to write it on your hand, whatever system you need to remember their name, really important. Even more important than their name is the little one's name. Um, gosh, there's no name we like better than our own name or our children's name. And that's actually a fact. Don't forget to offer them a drink and a snack. We just do coffee waters, and then not so healthy, honestly, but we do chocolate chip cookies, and you know why? I'll tell you why. Because it smells so good when you walk in the building. It just smells delicious. It's very warm and homey. We used to do sourdough bread. I had this super cool recipe, and all my teachers got a little tired of making sourdough bread when they were opening the building in the morning. So I don't do sourdough bread anymore, but that's an awesome one. If you're just making muffins, even box muffins, it smells really good. Don't be shy. You're the expert about the children at your school and about group care. The parent is always the expert about their child, but you are absolutely the expert about your program. And also, quite honestly, the children in your class um, and their child in a group setting. Super important. Talk more than you listen. I love that one. Parents are pretty much an open book. They want you to solve their problem. And so... If you talk more than you listen, you're not going to understand what their problem is. Their problem is they might feel guilty about going back to work. This is such a problem with, with parents, particularly moms, but I think for dads as well, and I'd love to hear from any man, um, that they're feeling guilty about leaving their little one in care, and they need to feel really good about it. why we are better for them during the day, given their situation. I mean, given a situation where they don't need or want to work, no problem. But they're coming to you because they need group care and they want the best care they can possibly get. So I absolutely love that I that taking the time to listen more than we talk really gives us a clue to what their needs are. Um, a lot of times parents now get shamed. Uh, why are you going back to work? You can afford to stay home. Or maybe their boomer parents are saying, oh, I wish I could have stayed home with you when you were little. I really regret it. It's a really personal and individual choice going back to work. And we are here to support every part of the family and that family decision. And anything we can do to help ease that is, is our job. And then don't neglect to get all contact information and your intake form completed. This is usually really easy if you've already done a good phone screening and then you come in and everything goes smoothly. They're there for 45 minutes or so. But if they're in a hurry, maybe they're running late, you have to speed up the tour a little bit. You'll be tempted to miss this part, but this is the part you can't miss because this has everything to do with your follow-up. So don't neglect to get all the contact information. 
So that's about a little bit more about tour best practices. And I'm keeping an eye on the clock so I can save a little bit of time for questions. Speed demo. Um, this has to do with your staff and how you help your staff help you be enrolled. Staff bonuses for on-the-spot enrollment or maybe if they enroll by Friday. So say a tour comes in on a Tuesday and the staff have to kind of um, focus and adapt for that tour to come into your building or to their particular classroom, you'll want to make sure that you're recognizing if they're helping you with the enrollment. I like to do $25 or $50 bonus. I like to do a shout out on, uh, on our morning message for our staff. Thank you so much for helping Ms. Summer get her classroom fully enrolled. Why is that good for the staff? Lots of reasons. First of all, they won't keep having tourists come in their room and interrupt their day, so that's good. But more important is best for kids. If there's less transition for children coming in and out of the classroom, the teacher can do better work, the children can do better play. So anytime we can bonus our staff to help us with our on, spot, on the spot or enrolling quickly is really helpful. So I like to bonus on that. The other thing we're doing is doing that full room bonus for the teachers and the co-teachers or TAs. Once they have that full enrollment in their room, the fact of the matter is it is a little bit more work. It's more students, it's more cleaning, it's more parents to communicate with, it's more evaluations or portfolios to do for the students. So it is more work. It's more teaming with the other teachers, it's more sharing your outdoor classroom space, it's just more. So I like to do full room bonuses for teachers. And it also helps them understand back to the lifetime value of a customer that if they don't accommodate the families reasonably and are not receptive and, and give good customer care, they possibly could lose the customer. That is definitely not better for the children. Where did Chloe go? Chloe was here for two months. They must not have been happy. They left. Now all of a sudden we got a tour again. So being generous with the teachers and really having a group common goal to get your room full is, I think, really important. Easy, easy tour promo gifts and enrollment gifts for new families. We like to do, I mean, obviously we love literacy. I keep talking about that. I like to give out books. I like to give out something specific to the age of the children, something like a onesie or a cute t-shirt. And then I'll give something different maybe at the 10th day and maybe at the 30th day. I'll give gifts, and it's usually branded items. It'll be a t-shirt, then it might be a sweatshirt. It might be, um, we've got really cute, the, um, the bags, the um, insulated bags that are logoed and are colors so that the parents can pack the children's lunch with the little blue pack, because a lot of our families pack lunch. Also for the bottles or the breast milk um, coming in frozen or um, breast milk maybe, and then regular bottles. Um, awesome, so we get our branded um, the bags. And then also just book bags, and they're not expensive. We we're happy to help you with sourcing all of those. Uh, again, always branded. You can do, you know, any age range, or sorry, price range on that, from the dollar store and Walmart to something a little bit more high end, depending on your clients. The idea is, thank you for coming in. We really appreciate the time you took. You know, the, the message is, we know there's other great care in our area, and thank you for considering us, and we really hope to see you back soon. That's really impressive. And then definitely following up and continuing to follow up. Tips and tricks. The first tip or trick is to keep your staff informed about your enrollment progress. Guys, our goal this month is to enroll one student a week, or we'd like to get the rooster room full. So everyone knows we're, how many phone calls do we have to have to come in, how many tours to get the room or the school full. Use occasional meetings for phone or tour training. This helps the staff grow their careers. We talk about career ladders a lot. It helps them understand about good customer care. It helps them get out of their shell. They're with two-year-olds all day. So for them to be able to interact with other adults is really important, and for them to understand what parents are actually looking for. So that you as the director or the owner, you're in the office and you get that call from a family that's upset, if the staff understands what the parents are asking when they first call, 
or when they first tour, it really makes a cohesive team to problem solve when the bumps come up. So using occasional meetings for training and customer care, we've really been focusing. Actually, 2019 for us will be all about customer care and responsiveness. And it's not that it's anything particularly negative right now. I just think it's, it's just a good overall strategy. And I consider customers, my customers are the staff, and the staff's customers are the families and the children, of course. So um, customer care all the way around. Leverage virtual day notes for Facebook posts and web content and your CRM campaigns. So your virtual day notes, anything that's really great, like a great picture or great activity, definitely grab that. Again, back to social proof that we talked about earlier, we want to grab those pictures and post those. Uh, this week, we had an absolutely amazing staff training. Um, Monday night, we were at, actually, we'll post it on our website and our Facebook page soon. It might be there already. Um, we had Eric Nelson from the Outdoor Classroom Project come and train. This is all three schools for the entire day and then trained everyone the whole evening. And so we'll post that, probably utilize that as we're working towards improving our outdoor classrooms. We want to be a certified outdoor classroom demonstration site in Virginia and so on. And so we'll use that USP, a unique selling point, to give social proof on Facebook on our website and in our CRM campaign to, again, enhance our tours and enhance the number of calls coming in. A lot of families really like that natural holistic approach. And so we're taking something we do and just making sure everyone knows we do it. But that's just the people that are there every day. I love to ask staff for their input and ideas. Um, it's sort of like the law of attraction in a way. If you just sort of put it out there, hey guys, I'm really struggling with whatever the issue is about enrollment or tours. What do you think? How can we do that better? Maybe they'll say, I hate that we do tours on Fridays. Well, why? Tell me why. Oh, the bookmobile comes, it's pizza Friday, and, you know, I'm always heading out of town. So how could you adapt on that? And how could you utilize the staff idea? where initially you think, no, we have to do tours on Fridays, think back and think, well, actually, if we don't do tours on Fridays, it might make families feel, I'm sorry, I don't have a tour available Friday. It might make them feel a little bit more urgent. So a lot of times when someone says something to me and I initially have a, a negative reaction or something that I think, no, let's just do it the way we've always done it. Again, I've done it for 35 years. I make myself slow down and utilize my team to give me the other point of view. And I find that really helpful. So asking staff for their input and ideas. And now we're gonna get a little creative. Easy ways to engage staff in enrolling. Social media is the easiest one. Particularly if you have a lot of millennials on your team, social media is it. Um, several schools I know and clients and also friends that have multiple schools use social media, oh my gosh, amazingly. And what they'll do is, Either have somebody maybe during nap time, maybe it's an extra job where they're not in the classroom and they're taking pictures. It's a, um, a staff member that loves photography or they love writing, right? And so they'll go around and post pictures on social media about maybe the classroom that you need to enroll in. I've got one room at one of my schools that I need to enroll for. I'm really working on getting threes and fours. It's hard to get threes and fours this time of the year because usually they're already set. You're getting lots of babies and wobblers and toddlers, but we're not getting as many three and four year old calls. So we're trying to leverage our social media very strongly and getting our message out about what we're doing at that particular school to serve three and four. Enrollment events is a really easy one. Doing, and we're coming up with holidays, so doing um, breakfast with Santa, an elf workshop. Maybe you're doing a food drive for Thanksgiving. We're doing something awesome. It's my favorite, one of my favorite things we do at Bright Beginning. We do how to cook a turkey. And every year for about 30 years, the local newspaper publishes how to cook a turkey by the students at Bright Beginning. And so I start with choose and I want them to do, you know, two or two sentences and usually their phrases or one word. Um, and then three is a little bit more and then the four is a little bit more. Um, they're much more articulate and they're comments will be more robust. So how to cook a turkey. And then I ask those open-ended questions because we talk about literacy all the time. 
And so we'll say, well, how do you cook a turkey? And so they'll, um, they might say, you know, you cook it for two minutes in the microwave and put mustard and salt and pepper and a little bit of maple syrup on top. Or they might say, we cook a turkey on the grill and grandpa comes over and he smokes cigars all day. They'll say hilarious things. You just wait a few minutes and let them talk. You can, um, you can get some really good content. Again, I'm leveraging. I'm getting creative. I'm having my children do something that's literacy-based, that's creative and imaginative, that adults love to read. And you know, I'm wrapping it all up into putting it in the newspaper with a couple pictures of our children. And oh my gosh, we get such leverage. People look for that piece in the paper. It's always the Wednesday morning in the food section right before Thanksgiving. So that's an example of getting creative, um, not an enrollment event, but just utilizing media as opposed to social media. A little old timey going um, that way with a newspaper, but it's really effective. And remember, when people are home on the holidays, they do maybe pick up the paper a little bit more. It's also got the link on the website for the, um, for the newspaper. And then, of course, we'll copy the link to our Facebook pages and website and whatnot. Tour follow-up. Lots of creative ways to follow up on a tour. The easiest one, honestly, is sending out handwritten thank you notes. And one thing I like to do, I'm sorry, I'm watching the clock. I have five minutes. Um, one thing I like to do is do the thank you note, and then I'll put just that paper confetti in the thank you note. It creates just a little bit of a, a bumpy, a lumpy mail. And then they open it up. It's almost like a little party in an envelope. They open it up. Thanks for coming to visit. Right, beginnings in this case, and just all this purple confetti falls out. I don't do glitter, and I don't do the sticky confetti. I just do the paper confetti to try to be a little bit uh, green and earth friendly. But the idea is getting creative. CRM campaigns. We'll probably talk about um, at length as we progress with our webinars. But CRM campaigns, same exact thing as your social media campaigns and leveraging. You just want to get the word out about everything you're doing in all your classes. And it, for the takeaway for CRM would be funneling out. So remember, I just told you I need to enroll threes and fours at one of my schools. So I'll create CRM campaigns with why to enroll at right beginning, what we're doing in terms of curriculum to prepare children for kindergarten, how play-based learning is valuable, uh, the bookmobile, the teacher, the teacher bio, anything I can do to segment out why a family should enroll at a particular school in a particular class using CRM. Photography, pictures worth a thousand words. I like galleries in that case, um, photo galleries that, um, you know, really, again, uh, International Mud Day in June. Hey, another thing we do is we get dirty, we get messy. If you want your child to have a wholesome outdoor education and lots of creative art, you know, look no further, and then lots of pictures. Blogs are a great way for your staff to get engaged. When we did our training the other night with Eric Nelson from the Outdoor Classroom Project, we had every staff member write two paragraphs for us. I'm, of course, going to get creative with it and use it for Facebook, for my website, and also for tours. So they had to do the first um, paragraph was, what did they learn? What were their ahas and wows? What, was, what, um, what struck them about the training? And then the second one was, how will you use that to, to better your curriculum and engage with your children? And it's just part of our process of adding to our already existing outdoor classroom. And I'm on the question slide. Carrie, I, I'm pretty good. I have four minutes left. And I have several questions that are starting to come in that I thought I would try to take, if that's okay with everyone. Um, the first one is, and this is really, really normal question um, for veteran teachers and directors and owners, um, and also for new people. So the first one is, what do I do in a tough situation when a tour comes in and say they observe something you're really embarrassed about? So say maybe it's something like um, the teacher has a, a voice tone issue or is just not at their best and a little bit impatient with a child. And the the natural inclination would be to ignore it and kind of talk over the teacher or guide them out of the room and don't be fooled. Those parents are noticing everything. Their radar is on red alert when they walk in your building. So instead of, 
ignoring it and steering them out of the room and thinking they didn't notice, what I'll do is I'll just, just own it. Two feet on the ground and just say, um, oh, we're, um, this classroom's in the middle of doing X, Y, and Z. We just added two new students and it's a pretty busy day here. Let me tell you a little bit about our staff training and how we support our staff on busy days like this. I'm available to come in and get extra breaks. We have an extra assistant director available to get an extra set of hands. We may go outside a little bit more when we've got new friends. We may out, be outside a little bit more so the teacher can get to know the new friends. Whatever the truth is, is what I'll say, but I will not shy away from something that doesn't look good. I'll just hit it heads on, head on because otherwise the parent will think, well, gosh, did the director or tour giver not even see that? No, they did. Don't worry, parents. Um, do they, do they, are they not transparent? Do they not want to address it? Most parents won't say, gosh, that teacher looks grumpy. They'll just think it and then they'll go out in the community and write a review about, I really like the director or the owner and most of the teachers, but that one classroom, that teacher was a grump or she didn't make eye contact with me or I heard her raise her voice at a child. So in a situation like that, I address up front and talk about training opportunities. I'll also maybe say something like that staff member is new. Um, we're working on training and, and our philosophy. Um, just like the children in the room, they come in at the beginning of being a three-year-old and they don't know how to do lots of things. The same thing with teachers. And so really gauging and, and noticing how much grace that parent is giving that teacher is really important too. But you want to let the parent know, I saw, I'm honored, I'm addressing it and you're not frazzled or ruffled, ruffled by something like that. Um, could be the teacher just doesn't feel well, and maybe they uh, just went to the dentist, and their mouth is has no cane on it, and they really can't smile, and they're super self-conscious about it. Um, that'd be a really good example of, you could say, oh, she just got that from the dentist. She, her mouth is numb, a poor thing, but bless her heart, here she is doing that art project with uh, the salt the salt play of the day. So there could be a legit reason that would just right there stop parents from worrying. And it looks like I'm, let's see, out of time. Here's what, time for one more question. Um, just to remind everybody what's next. We have one more master class in 2018, and it's a really good one, guys. We're going to ask you to send us questions, and we'd love to take anything staffing, which is what we focused on for the entire year. It's called Staffing Q&A with Kathy Ligon and Kathy Petzl. It's the last Thrive Masterclass of the year. And then in 2019, we head on into succession planning, which is not just about selling your school. It's all the stages and the timeline and the years leading up to that. So it's going to be super meaty and robust. And, you know, Kathy Ligon is the star on, on all of our masterclasses and, I'm just so excited to have you all on here today. We have so many people. I know lots of you, so thanks, guys. The people I know, thank you so much for joining us. And I think we're out of time. Carrie, if you want me to take another question. Oh, oh, here's a question that just came in. Yay. Oh, my gosh. Thanks, guys. I love it. Um, how do you get teachers to understand that full enrollment for the school is different from, from full enrollment in just their class? For instance, our capacity is 120, but we only have four and a half classes right now. Our teachers argue that we are full just because they're class size, and we are having a hard time getting them to understand that we are nowhere close to capacity. Super meaty question, Erin, thanks for that question. Um, I, would start with, um, I would start with a monopoly. Well, no, I would start with lifetime value of a customer. So if this, if there's, um, so they have like, maybe they're half full if they have four and a half classes. I don't know what the age groups or ratios are for this school or what state they're in. But if in general, um, maybe they have 60 kids and they're fully staffed. First question I would make sure about is, can they get staff for the enrollment? If they've got the quality in place foundation and then they've got the staff in place and trained and ready to go, um, then they're ready to do enrollment. I would do the lifetime value of a customer and make sure they understand that every time we don't have an enrollment, we're losing $50,000. And what could we do with $50,000? And how could that benefit each teacher? And then also, um, 
after lifetime value, I would do the monopoly game that I talked about with how the money is dispersed and what, again, what would be the value of having that enrollment? Um, what would be the value of having six or eight more staff in our school? Would that lighten our load? Would that help us be able to add, um, add a garden or add, because if you're missing staff and you're only half full, then I would sit with the staff and say, okay, we're a great team. What are we missing on our team? What unique strengths are we missing that we want to hire and recruit for? They're in the driver's seat at school. So, um, Aaron, I'm happy to talk to you offline about it as well. But I think um, it's a really hard one. But I think we could approach it with three or four steps and um, get that all settled for you very easily. Uh, Carrie's telling me I have to stop now. Um, we're a little bit about a couple minutes after two. Again, we've got our master class, last one of the year on Tuesday, December 11th. Please make sure you register early. And don't forget to register for SHIFT, our conference in Austin. It's going to be so much fun and just fabulous speakers. So it's got rave reviews last year, and I'm expecting it to just exceed that this year. So thank you very much again, and feel free to email questions. We do our best to get answers out to you in a timely fashion. We're a little backed up on a couple of webinars. We've done quite a few lately. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next month. And Kathy Ligon will be back. Thank you.